From New York City, the makers of Clipper Craft Clothes for Men and more than 1,200 leading retail stores from coast to coast present that immortal character created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes, starring John Stanley. This week's story, The Adventure of the Bloomsbury Ballad. Holmes, why the deuce are we prowling around inside this deserted old house? To observe, Watson, and perhaps to meet an occupant. Ah, confounded, Holmes. The place has been empty and boarded up for 30 years. No one lives here. So, no one lives here, Watson. Listen. the door of Dr. John Watson's study, and we're about to hear another of his adventures with the fabulous Sherlock Holmes. Well, good evening, Mr. Harris. <laughs> good evening, Dr. Watson. Uh, what memoir do you have for us tonight, sir? I call it The Adventure of the Bloomsbury Ballad, Mr. Harris. And after you've presented your audience with a few facts on Clippercraft clothes, I shall be very glad to tell you the whole story. Thank you, Doctor. Consider the words inexpensive and value. Now, the price of a suit tells you whether or not it is inexpensive, but tells you nothing about its quality. So you must consider not only the cost, but also what you get for your money before you can be sure you have a real value. And two words that really, truly mean honest value are clippercraft, because clippercraft means higher quality at lower prices. And clippercraft clothes are available at your local independent clippercraft dealer, the store you can trust. You can always identify these clothes by the famous Clippercraft label, the wheel of a clipper ship. Just examine Clippercraft's expensive looking top coats and overcoats at only $40 to $47.50. Then check Clippercraft's handsome new zipper lining top coats, and you'll see how much less you'll pay for quality that's finer. Yes, for the real meaning of the word value, just compare Clippercraft with clothes selling for many dollars more. And now, Dr. Watson, what about the adventure of the Bloomsbury Ballad? Well, Mr. Harris, it took place just before the turn of the century, in December of 1899. Now, this time, Holmes and I became involved through an old and personal friendship of mine. On Bloomsbury Square here in London stood a once imposing townhouse, which for 30 years had been empty and boarded up. <laughs> Perhaps, Mr. Harris, I'm getting ahead of my story. It actually begins in the legal office of the Honorable Reginald Dudley, solicitor, on Chancery Lane, near the Temple. One afternoon, Mr. Dudley received an unexpected visitor. So, you don't recognize me, Mr. Dudley. <laughs> Look here, my dear sir. I'm a very busy man. You've come to my office without an appointment. I assure you that I haven't the faintest idea who you are. Then let me refresh your memory, Mr. Dudley. Thirty years ago, a financier named Sir Percy Whitford owned a great house on Bloomsbury Square. He had two daughters, the eldest Elaine, the younger Elizabeth, a beautiful girl with great talent at the harp. Elizabeth, incidentally, married a man named Arthur Harvey. Shall I go on? Yes, yeah, yes, go on. Sir Percy Whitford became involved in some illegal financial scandal, and the family was disgraced. Arthur Harvey, because of the stain on the family name, left the Whitford, vanished. And Sir Percy, with his two daughters, fled England, sailed for Canada. You seem to be well informed so far, my friend. I am indeed. A reason you shall learn later. But to proceed. The vessel carrying the Whitfords went down off Ireland with no survivors. The residue of the Whitford estate, some 50,000 pounds, and the old house is now being administered by yourself as solicitor. That is true. But since there are no living relatives of the Whitfords, the old house goes up for auction next week and the money disposed of at my discretion. Now, Mr. Dudley, that is where you're mistaken. Uh, what do you mean? There is a living relative of the Whitfords. Oh, indeed. Who? Myself. I am Arthur Harvey. You... You are yes, Arthur... Mr. Dudley, and I have the credentials to prove it. As the husband of Elizabeth Whitford, deceased, I am the sole heir to the Whitford fortune. Yes? Who is it? The room clerk here at the hotel, Mr. Harvey. I have a message for you, sir. Oh, just a moment. 
I... What the... You! No! No, no! Uh, uh. By Jove, Holmes. Mm, what is it, Watson? Well, according to the morning telegraph here, a man named Arthur Harvey, recently returned from India, was stabbed to death in his rooms at the Travellers Club on Pall Mall yesterday evening. The official police have no clues to the identity of the mysterious assailant. Indeed, a most regrettable affair, no doubt. I, What is it, Watson? You look a bit upset. Well, Holmes, I, I knew Arthur Harvey many years ago in India. We fought through the Afghan war together. Indeed, he saved my life from the Ghazis near Kandahar. Really? You know, I, I recall his telling me he was the sole member by marriage of the now extinct Wickford family on Bloomsbury Square. I see. And so you would like to catch his murderer and avenge his death? Yes, Holmes, I would indeed. In that case, Watson, let us proceed at once to Pall Mall and the Travellers Club. <laughs> Lucky the official police haven't moved the body yet. Arthur Harvey here was stabbed at the entrance to the door here, fell back into the room, dressed in nightrobe and on the point of retiring. The knife was plunged deep and straight into the heart and... Aha! What is it, Holmes? Note, Watson. Observe on the dead man's nightrobe a tiny bit of yellow paper in the shape of a star. What about it? This is a bit of paper clipped by a railway ticket collector's punch. You mean Harvey here was riding a train just before... No, 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 no. The killer was riding a train before he came here, Watson. This bit of paper from the ticket collector's punch clung to his coat. When the assassin stabbed Harvey, the paper remnant was transferred from the killer's coat to Harvey's nightrobe in the close contact. Now then, Watson. Yes, Holmes? I recall reading that the Wickford House on Bloomsbury Square is up for auction next week with a solicitor named Reginald Dudley as administrator. That is correct. Add to that the fact that Arthur Harvey here was the legitimate heir to the property, and we have an intriguing problem. By Jove, Holmes, you're right. Quite. But now suppose we divide forces. You investigate the origin of this ticket punch with the London Railway System, and I shall pay a call on Mr. Dudley. <laughs> And you have no idea who might have murdered Arthur Harvey, Mr. Dudley? No, Mr. Holmes, I do not. You must be aware, however, that Harvey might have had several enemies. Indeed? Yes, yes. You see, you see there are still many claimants that will work for the state. Some imposters, some with vague claims. Some of these people were desperate for money. And, well, you understand? Yes, quite. To destroy the only legitimate heir would re-establish other claims in the court. An obvious conclusion, Mr. Dudley. Perhaps too obvious. And oh, oh, before I leave, yes. you are left-handed, are you not, Mr. Dudley? Well, yes, yes, I am, but how... Did... A few elementary observations not worthy of explanation. I wish to point out, however, that you have a black smudge on your left cuff, a rather jarring note in an otherwise fastidious ensemble. Now, Mr. Dudley, I must bid you good evening. Ah, Watson, any results? Uh, Holmes, I've been running around London like a madman, trying to trace down that ticket punch. I've been to every railway station above and under the ground. Oh, come, man, get to the point. Did you find the origin of that ticket remnant? Yes, Holmes, I did. It was used last night by a collector on the Central London Railway. And he used that particular ticket punch between the stations of the British Museum in Bloomsbury and Chancery Lane. Bloomsbury to Chancery Lane. Capital, Watson. You've completed a first-class bit of investigation. We're making excellent progress. Come, let's be off. Where to, Holmes? Bloomsbury Square. I should like to have a look at the old Wickford house. Well, Watson, there it is. The old Wickford house. Yes, Holmes. Confounded while we're down here on Bloomsbury Square in the dead of night just to Watson, look at it. Look. Where? At that window on the upper story, a light. Light? I don't see any light, Holmes. You must be mistaken. On the contrary, I'm quite sure I saw the glimmer of a light, and I'm positive this house has an occupant. <laughs> the place has been deserted for three decades. Has it, Watson? Suppose we effect an entrance and see for ourselves. Well, Dr. Watson, Dr. Watson, this is an unusual adventure. What about that light in the window of the deserted house? What happened after that? A series of very strange events, Mr. Harris. And I shall relate them to you immediately after you present a few facts 
on Clipper Croft's clothes. You may not know it, but you have a personal value scout right in your own hometown. Your private agent is the friendly independent store in your community that sells clothes with the Clipper Craft label. Your Clipper Craft dealer spent plenty of time seeking out the greatest clothing value your money could buy. And naturally, he chose Clipper Craft. And why wouldn't he? When Clipper Craft makes it possible for you to own one of the most luxurious suits you've ever seen for only $40 or $45. And a Clipper Craft suit of pure worsted for as little as $45. A suit with more hand tailoring details than you would ever expect to find at that low price. It takes great planning to give you so much fine quality for so little money. In fact, it takes the concentrated buying power of more than 1,200 independent Clipper Craft dealers from coast to coast. That's why men who know insist on Clipper Craft clothes bearing the Clipper Craft label. So be sure to visit the Clipper Craft store in your city. These leading stores in the metropolitan area are proud to add their names to Clipper Craft in your suits, top coats, and overcoats. In Manhattan, John Wanamaker Men's Stores, Broadway at 8th and 67 Liberty Street. Saks 34th, Broadway at 34th. In Brooklyn, Abraham and Strauss. In Newark, New Jersey, Boulevard Men's Shop, Kresge, Newark. And in Jamaica, the B&B Clothes Shop, 16408 Jamaica Avenue. Now, Dr. Watson, you were relating to us the adventure of the Bloomsbury Ballot. So I was, Mr. Harris. So I was. As you remember, Holmes saw a light in the window and determined to effect an entrance. We managed to get into the house through a ground floor window. Then we started to prowl through the house, through the cold, dark rooms laden with the dust of the years, cluttered with grotesque furniture and the relics of a musty past. And then... I chose. What the devil is it? Who is it? Sounds like a ghostly musician upstairs playing a... Precisely, Watson. A harp. But why, Holmes? Why? Why would anyone play a harp here in this empty, gloomy house? Suppose we go upstairs and see. She's dressed. The style of 30 years ago. Good evening. Oh, oh. oh. good evening, gentlemen. My, my, but I'm afraid you startled me. Did we? Oh, indeed you did. I had no idea we were that cold this evening. But, oh, then welcome to Wickford House. Oh, thank you, madam. Uh, won't you sit by the fire and warm yourself? My sister Elaine will be here presently. Elaine? Yes, I am Elizabeth Wickford, and my sister is Elaine. Well, that's absurd. You're both supposed Quiet, to be... Quiet, Watson. Miss Wickford, allow me to present Dr. Watson. I am Sherlock Holmes. Oh, Dr. Watson, Sherlock Holmes, how nice, how very nice. Didn't I meet you at the reception last week? Reception, madam? What reception? Why, in Buckingham Palace to Her Majesty Queen Victoria. I must say, Her Majesty looks very young for 35. Oh, the Queen Victoria's gone, you know. Now it's Edward. I'm afraid we were not invited to the reception, madam. I trust it was a brilliant affair. Oh, yes, Mr. Holmes. Lovely, lovely. A distinguished gathering. I met Benjamin Disraeli, Jenny Lind, Alfred Tennyson. Holmes, you know, the woman is mad. All Mary? these people are oh. dead. Yes, quite often. Awesome. Uh, yes, Miss Whitford, they're all famous indeed. This is a great and fruitful year for Britain, isn't it? Yes, Mr. Holmes, yes, indeed. And in less than 30 years, we shall all be seeing the turn of the new century. Isn't it exciting? Uh, it's amazing. In a few days now, it'll be the new year, 1873. Oh, I do wish Arthur was with me now. Arthur? Oh, yes, Arthur Harvey, my husband. You see, I am really Mrs. Arthur Harvey, but, uh, 
Arthur left me not long ago. Something about one of Father's unfortunate financial transactions. It's uh, Percy Rickford, you know. And you don't know where Arthur is? No, Mr. Holmes. But every evening at this time here in my house, I play the harp. Arthur loves the harp. In that selection I was just playing was his favorite. I play it in the hope that he will return to me someday. Let us hope, madam, that he will. Elizabeth! Oh. Elizabeth, is there someone with you? Oh, Elaine, come into the sitting room, my dear. Elizabeth, I was once... Oh. Elaine, this is Mr. Holmes, and, and this is Dr. Watson, gentlemen, my sister Elaine with me. Uh, the How do you do, do then? Yeah. I cannot say that I've had the pleasure. Uh, we have some acquaintance with Arthur Harvey. Isn't that lovely, Elaine? They know Arthur, Arthur. And, and of course, we shall ask them to stay to see you, with a gentleman. Oh, we should be delighted. Uh, Elizabeth, dear, it's rather late, and I don't think... Oh, we... please, Elaine, it's so lonely in this big house, and we haven't had gentlemen callers in such a long time. Very well. Uh, Suppose you continue with your music, Elizabeth, until tea is ready. I'll chat with our two guests in the library. Oh, you are such a dear, Elaine. Oh, won't it be cozy to have tea for the fire again? By Jove, Miss Elaine, we were sure you were dead. As far as the world knows, Dr. Watson, we are dead. But now that you two are here... I'm afraid we cannot keep our secret any longer. The fact is, we were on that ship with our father, Sir Percy, when it went down. But Elizabeth and I found a raft and made our way to shore. Yet you deliberately concealed the fact that you were alive. Yes, Mr. Holmes. After our father disgraced us, we, we wanted to hide from the world. And you've lived here in absolute seclusion for 30 years? Yes, Dr. Watson, for 30 years. No one else has ever been here. No tradesman, no other visitor. I go out only at night to purchase the necessities. Hmm, I see. Rather unusual situation, isn't it, Watson? I should say, sir. But, Miss Elaine, about your sister Elizabeth, I can't say I quite understand. Oh, Elizabeth, well, you see, I'm afraid she's a little unbalanced, Dr. Watson. The shock of the family, disgrace, the disappearance of her husband, the shipwreck... Oh, caused her to lose her mind. She actually thinks she's living back in 1872. Yes, so we gathered. But uh, as to Arthur Harvey, Miss Whitford, I presume you have not yet heard the news. What? Arthur Harvey is dead. Arthur? Dead? Yes. He was murdered here in London last night. Oh, I see. Well, perhaps it is just as well. Elizabeth was beyond our hope long ago. And she could not stand another shock. I ask only that you gentlemen humor her, as I have, while you are here. We will indeed. You can count on us, Miss Whitford. Thank you, gentlemen. And now, shall we go in to tea? Watson. Now, here we are at the rear entrance. Joe Holmes, it's fantastic. Those two elderly women living alone in this gloomy old house. Living in the past. It... Holmes, what the deuce are you looking at? The surface of this long pathway to the street. There's a layer of coal dust on it. What of it, Holmes? They burn coal in the fireplace. Precisely, Watson. And you couldn't have failed to observe that the coal scuttle at the hearth was almost empty and that the two elderly ladies will need more fuel by tomorrow night. What the devil are you talking about? The Wickford sisters... Are not... The Wickford sisters, Watson. They are clever imposters working with the assassin who killed your friend Harvey. You took your time getting that bucket of coal here tonight, Dudley. I should say you did, Mr. Solicitor. You've been late with it every night. What do you expect us to do, freeze to death? Now, see here, you two. I'm sick and tired of having to carry that confounded coal up that long garden path. Oh, oh indeed, we... you're sick and tired. Yes, what about us, Margie and me, hanging about this old house? 
dressed up in these silly clothes, posing as a couple of balmy old ladies, the Wickford sisters. <laughs> You'll just have to see it through until the auction comes off and the authorities discover you living here. Oh, very well, we'll see it through. But we each get a third of inheritance, mind you. will get it, you'll get and it. And while we're on the subject of discovery, it might interest you to know we had a couple of gentlemen callers last night. Gentlemen callers? Who? Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Not that they found anything. We pulled the wool over their eyes, we did. Sherlock Holmes? Precisely, Mr. Dudley. Holmes. Dr. Watson and I decided to return again tonight for more tea, Mr. Dudley. And I'd advise all of you not to make a false move. My colleague has a pistol, as you see, and he will not hesitate to use it. <laughs> Holmes, here in our rooms at Baker Street, this whole thing seems like an unpleasant dream. The whole thing was a clever, romantic swindle, eh? Yes, quite. Dudley killed Arthur Harvey to remove the last legitimate heir. Yes, but Holmes, how the deuce did you know that Dudley... The ticket punch, the ticket punch proved that the killer had made a train journey from Bloomsbury to Chancery Lane. And Dudley's office is on Chancery Lane. But the empty coal scuttle at the Whitford fireplace was by far the most salient clue, Watson. How? Both... Elizabeth and Elaine are elderly ladies. They needed coal to heat that sitting room. And neither were strong enough to carry a full coal bucket up that long garden path. But no tradesman could have carried out the task, since the secret would be discovered. Yet it had to be a man with a man's strength. And that man had to be Reginald Dudley. Precisely. Especially since Dudley was left-handed, and since I had noted a black smudge on his left cuff when I saw him at his legal office. Holmes, for my part, well, I'm profoundly grateful, you know. After all, it was my personal friendship with Arthur Harvey that... Not at all, my dear fellow, not at all. I, I found the adventure most invigorating. And with your indulgence, Watson, I should like to add a, a final conclusion to your memoirs. Yes, Holmes? What conclusion? You may quote me, Watson, as saying that, in my opinion, the violin is a much more pleasing instrument than the harp. <laughs> Well, Dr. Watson, that was an interesting adventure. Thank you, Mr. Harris. And, Doctor, what adventure will you relate to us next week? Next week's story, Mr. Harris, is called The Adventure of the Devil's Foot. It concerns some wild laughter, a lamp that burned by day, and a strange footprint in the garden. Makers of Clippercraft clothes in more than 1,200 stores from coast to coast have brought you another in the new series of broadcasts featuring the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Our stories are based upon the character Sherlock Holmes, created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, and the program is produced and directed by Basil Lockram. Sherlock Holmes is played by John Stanley. Dr. Watson by George Felton. This week's story was written by Max Ehrlich with special music by Albert Berman. If you don't know your Clippercraft dealer, write Clippercraft, 200 Fifth Avenue, New York City. Infantile paralysis knows no mercy. It stalks the country, leaving its hideous mark on helpless little children. It must be stopped, but it can't be stopped without your help. Millions of dollars are needed, so... Send all the dimes and dollars you can spare to your local March of Dimes headquarters. Join the March of Dimes. Be sure to listen next week to Sherlock Holmes in The Adventure of the Devil's Foot. Harris speaking for Clippercraft Code. This is a mutual broadcasting tool.